One. So we're going to spend some time today uh, talking about Hooke's Law. Um, and Hooke's Law is what we were studying, is what we were studying um, on Friday. So you collected data that the sort of the result is what's known as Hooke's Law. So there are lots of questions about like, why does the graph look this way? And what exactly is this slope? What does it mean? So we're going to spend some time talking about it today. You should have time, bless you, to work on the homework that's due tonight that is about Hooke's Law. And there's a, many of you that got it started and some of you that even finished it. So I think once you feel comfortable with that formula, it'll go really, really smoothly. It's nothing too complicated. We'll do some more interesting stuff with Hooke's Law in our next unit. But for right now, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so I figured we would talk about it today. Uh, so what does this graph look like? If I put up, let's see, force on the y-axis, delta x on the horizontal axis. Let's see, uh, Flora, what does this graph look like? Yeah, it should be, it's a, should be a straight line, but what we saw is it looked something like this, right? There was a little bit of curve in that line, right? Some uh, more than others. What did we expect the y-intercept to be, Caitlin? So let's say the intercept wasn't zero. Let's say the intercept was here. What would that tell us? Sally, what would that mean if the intercept wasn't zero? Mm -hmm. Right, this is saying if I apply some force, it doesn't stretch at all, okay? Or if you thought it might have intersected down like over here, right? That would mean I pulled on it a little bit and it didn't take any force. Now, according to Hooke's Law, that doesn't happen. But for real life objects, it does. So if you got that result on Friday, that's not unreasonable, but that's not what we were expecting. So we're going to have to compare what we saw on Friday versus what Hooke's Law tells us. So that's a good example, right? Where we saw one thing in lab, sort of the science is telling us something a little bit different. That's okay, as long as we know why they don't agree. All right, and then finally, um, what are the units of the slope of this graph? Uh, Crystal, what would be the units of the slope of this graph? Yeah, so if we do the units of the Y, the units of the X, you would get newtons per centimeter, right? Today, we'll also see newtons per meter, right? And this thing has a special name that we'll talk about, right? So that's a little bit of a review um, from Friday. Like I said, today we're talking about Hooke's Law. So let's go right to it. So this is uh, Robert Hooke. He was sort of a contemporary with Newton. He's a little bit older than Newton. Um, and in the 1600s, he discovered what he was calling sort of the law of elasticity. Um, it's also known as Hooke's law or the spring law. Okay, and in his notebook, it was very popular back then to take your science notes, not in English, but to take your science notes in Latin. And he wrote a anagram, right? A scrambled up version of this phrase, ut tension sic vis, which translated into English is, as the extension, so the force. As you stretch an object, the force also increases. This is the basis of material science. So if you're interested at all in how they design materials, steels, concretes, if you're interested in like the threads and fabrics that make up the clothes that we wear, anything that you can pull on or push on will, to some degree, obey Hooke's Law. Okay. Even something like why you might take a fabric and put it on the bias, right? And why that pulling on it will change the shape differently comes down to Hooke's law and later research that was done. And the last interesting thing I want to tell you about Hooke is that Isaac Newton despised him. Isaac Newton hated Robert Hooke. Robert Hooke later in his life developed a hunchback as he got older and Isaac Newton made fun of him for it. You're famous, perhaps? No, I don't appreciate, well, Isaac Newton was an insecure person because of how smart he was. But there's a famous phrase you might have heard that Isaac Newton said. He said, I've only seen far because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. 
that's an insult to Robert Hook because Robert Hook had a hunchback. After Robert Hook died, Isaac Newton had many of his papers destroyed. Very pe a very petty man. And because of that, because of that, material science was set back over 100 years. While we know of Hook's discovery because it was hidden in his notebook, written in Latin, um, people had to rediscover Hook's law and our understanding of the materials around us. It took us more time to figure that stuff out. So I always like to tell this story because it's important to think these were like people too. And uh, maybe this isn't the best example of being a person, but it is an intersection between, you know, Robert Hook and um, Isaac Newton. Now, when we look at um, Hooke's law, right? So this is the formula that is Hooke's law. Um, yes, or John. Nope, so this is in the reference table. It's written a little differently in the reference table. It says F sub S equals K delta, KX. I like to add some of these extra symbols because it makes it clear what's going on. But no, the general version, again, FS equals KX is in the, it's on the last page of the reference table. Okay. Each one of these symbols means something. All right, let's start off with something uh, simple, the arrows on top. What, is, what does that tell us about these things, Sabrina? We put the arrows on top. Not that it's moving, it's a special kind of measurement. Oh, Andrea, what kind of measurements are these? There are vectors, okay? And we know that. Uh, what does, what do you think that F stands for, Daisy? Force, right? So we give it a special name when we're talking about a spring. We call it the restoring force. We'll draw a picture that makes the restoring part clear. Some of you came up with that on Friday, okay? Next, we will talk about, let's see what I do next. Oh. All right, delta X, that is the change in the length of the spring. That change can be positive or that change could be negative. Again, we'll draw a picture that shows the two differences, okay? Next up, we have the K that's known as the spring constant. And finally, we have that minus sign. Melanie, what do you think that minus sign tells us? All right, that second part, opposite. Which two things in this formula are opposite? Lord, what do you think? So the spring constant is just a number. Let's think about opposite in terms of direction. That's a good place to get started. Bailey, what's opposite? So let's say K delta X is in the positive direction. What would that say about F? It's going the other way, right? So that sort of really taught, shows us this restoring force idea. Again, you're not going to see the minus sign in the reference table because they don't think you can understand what the minus sign means. But I know you can. It has to do with the opposite direction piece. That F and delta X are always in the opposite direction. Good job. Correct. K is just a, it's a, um, most constants and all the ones we'll look at are scalars. So they're just, um, they don't have direction. Okay. So for example, there's no such thing as like a negative spring constant, right? All springs that we know of behave uh, in this way that when you stretch them, they pull you in. And when you push them, when you compress them, they push out. We don't know of any springs that do the opposite of that, for example. Okay. All right, so here's an example of a spring. For every spring, it has its equilibrium length. It's natural length, it's sometimes called. It's unstretched length. This was the very first measurement we made on Friday, when you just measured how long the rubber band was without pulling on it. Okay, so for this spring, it would be this distance here, from the wall to this green line. Which way have, what have we done to the spring? We've pulled on it to the right, okay? Which arrow represents the displacement 
of how much we've stretched the spring. Joy, which arrow on here do you think it is? Yeah, the green arrow. It showed that I pulled the spring, I made the spring longer by this amount, okay? Now, you know if you take a spring or the rubber band you're not front, you pull on them, it pulls back. And so that forces in the opposite direction, okay? Now, let's look at, let's look at a live version of this. Right, so again, it shouldn't surprise us. Let's see if I put the spring force, the displacement, right? Right now, there's no applied force. There's no, it doesn't pull back, right? As I start to pull it to the right, you see that force grows and grows and grows, right? Apply a lot of force, get a lot of stretch. Apply a little bit of force, get a little bit of stretch, okay? Just like what our graph showed that we started off class. If we wanna go the other way, and I want to compress the spring, right? Now, the displacement is going to be in the opposite direction. I'm compressing the spring, and the spring force points now to the right. And so you'll notice the green arrow and the blue arrow are always in opposite directions. That's that minus sign that we saw that Melody told us means they're in the opposite direction. Green arrow, blue arrow will always be in the opposite direction. Okay. And so we can, like I said, we can do it for stretching the spring and we can do it for compressing the spring. Okay. Give you a second to write that down. Now that part definitely makes sense to us, right? If you've ever used a, a spring or a hair elastic or rubber band, this, is, this makes sense. The next thing I want to talk about is, well, how much should it stretch by? Right, you can think of rubber bands that are really stretchy, that are really easy to pull, or you can think of more stiff rubber bands that you pull on them and they don't move a lot. Right? And that is the purpose of the spring constant. Oh, sorry. Oh, and if we look at this on a graph, we already talked about, you have to copy this down again, that we end up with this, the more you pull it, the more force it takes to do that. All right, so we have the spring constant. We'd say it's the measure of the stiffness of a spring. Okay, the larger the spring constant is, the bigger the number is, the stiffer the spring is. All right, it has the dimensions of force divided by length, right? So Crystal gave us an example of for, of newtons per centimeter. You'll also see newtons per meter, okay? Those are the two that you'll see. But any unit of force divided by any unit of length. So like really, really um, uh, small springs, it might be newtons per millimeter, for example. But like I said, you'll see newtons per meter, newtons per centimeter. So let's think about, if I have these two springs now, one that has a spring constant of 100 newtons per meter and another that is 200 newtons per meter, what's different about them? When I pull on them, how is that pull different? All right, so I'm gonna give you two minutes. I'm gonna talk about that with the people you're sitting with. You might wanna draw a picture that shows what's different when you apply the same force on them. You might wanna draw a graph that shows how they're different uh, or you might wanna write a sentence or two about it, okay? So you've got two minutes. I want to know what the difference is. Did you say that the same force is the same You could, th that's one way so to help you describe what the difference is. So if I pulled with 10 newtons on both of them, what would be different about the, the two springs is, is one way to think about it. So the one, would you, on one of them, mm -hmm. you would apply more force to it? Or when. So it, every spring can do a different amount of force, depending on how much you pull on it. So when would I get, you got to be more specific about when I would get a different amount of force. 
So if I pull one like a meter and the other two meters, will I get different cores? Greater pick one thing to stay the same and then talk about how the other thing changes. So either say I have the same force, how is the stretch different? Or say it's the same stretch, how is the force different? So I'll try to think of both at the same time. Let's say I pulled on both of them with 10 newtons. Which one would stretch more? Or think the other way, if I stretched each one a meter, which one would take more force to do it? So pick one of those to think about. So, mm -hmm. would, okay, so wouldn't the stretch and the force just be different for this? Well, so because you get to pick for every, every, if I give you a spring, you can choose to stretch it any amount you want. Yeah. So you have to pick one of those things to be a constant. Either keep the force a oh. constant and how much is the stretch, or pick the stretch the same and think about what the force would do. Because you can't, if you change both at the okay, same so time, the you could get them to be the same. When? Well, you have to pick which is the con which is the constant which are you changing. I'm just asking what's different about them. Yeah. When? That's not always true. All right. So before we talk about uh, the specifics here, I want to let you know if I have these two springs, one that's 100 newtons per meter and one that's 200. If I'm careful and I do my calculation right, I can pull on them with the right amount of force so that they each stretch the same amount. Or I could stretch them the certain amount so that they each get the same force. You can't think of changing two things at the same time, right? So I heard some people saying, oh, well, the forces would have to be different. Not necessarily, right? If I stretched the, the 100 Newton per meter one, let's say two centimeters, and the 200 Newtons per meter one centimeter, that would take the same amount of force. All right, so one way to visualize how they are different is to, well, first, they have a different amount of stiffness. Which one is gonna be harder to stretch? The 200 one. Every meter I wanna pull it takes 200 Newtons. Every meter I wanna pull it takes 200 Newtons. For the 100 meter, Newton per meter, it just takes 100 Newtons for every meter. So that's what it means to be a stiffer spring. It's harder, needs more force to do the pull, okay? What would that look like if I was making a graph? Think back to the graph we made on Friday when we talked about the beginning of class. Kayla, how do they look different? So one with 200 would be steeper? Yeah, so the one with 200 would look steeper. So this would be our 200 Newton per meter, and this would be our 100 Newton per meter, okay? So if we can do it, we could think about this graph in two ways. I could say, all right, I wanna stretch it my spring two meters. Well, the 100 Newton per meter stretches, needs less force than, the 200 Newton per meter spring. Needs twice as much force to stretch the same amount. Or you could say, oh, what if I want to apply two Newtons of force? Well, for two Newtons of force, I get less stretch on the 200 Newton per meter than I would on the 100 Newton per meter. Two different ways to think about it. And as Kayla said, if you draw the steeper graph, you get both for free. You pick, do I want to do the same force on both and see which stretches more? Or do I want to stretch them the same and see which one takes more force? Some people like to do that visually. You could, of course, just use the formula to get the numbers, and then you would compare them. I want to give you options, OK? And it's pretty common, probably every other year, there'll be a graph like this, and you'll have to figure out either the slope, so you could say what the spring constant is, or you'll have to read off the graph and say, oh, well, when it was two meters, it was two newtons. I've seen both versions. Right. So visually, let's 
again, take a look at this on a particular set of springs, right? So again, I've got my 200 Newton per meter spring and my 100 Newton per meter string. I'm gonna pull on them with the same amount of force and the 100 Newton per meter spring stretches more, what we were expecting, all right? So I'm gonna also post the link for this website that will let you change the, um, the spring constant as well as change the applied force. And uh, that'll let you play around and kind of see what happens when you change one, how does it change the other, right. So the best way to understand this, of course, is gonna be by doing practice questions. So applying, new, applying Hooke's Law is really, really straightforward once you start getting the hang of it. Like I said, some of you have already completed the homework and are experts at using Hooke's Law. So you have two options. You can either work on homework number 19 that is due tonight. I think it's seven questions about Hooke's Law. Or you can work in the workbook starting on page 294. So if you finished up your homework, you can go to page 294. And um, probably the first two pages of the questions are Hooke's Law questions. The next set are about another thing with Hooke's Law. We'll wait till next unit to do that. So don't get too far ahead of yourself. So those are your, um, your two options. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, talk about, um, I've come to a idea based off of your feedback on how we're going to do um, test corrections. So in the back, I have a copy of the multiple choice for the exam with a answer sheet that has what you put for each multiple choice question and whether you got it right or not. Um, I'm gonna hand that out today and then what you'll do is for each question you got wrong, you can do as many of them as you want that you got wrong. The more you do, the more credit you'll get back. You're gonna go through and we're gonna take the, uh, the usual phrase of like, I don't know, right? We're gonna flip it on its head. We're gonna do uh, K, D, I. So in the Google form, you're gonna tell me what you did know about that question. Then you're gonna tell me what you didn't know, why you weren't able to get it. And then for the I, it's uh, inquiry. You're gonna ask a question about it. Or what was it that you needed to know that would have helped you have got it right? And sometimes that might be, I didn't understand what the question was, or that might be, I didn't really understand this thing. Um, it'll be different from person to person. And you'll do however many questions that you got wrong. The more questions you get right, the, the more questions you do, the more credit that you will get. So I have the directions page for that as well as the answers and the questions. I'll pass it out. Um, I'll post the link to the stuff on Google Classroom and I'll give you until the next test to get that done, All right? So you'll have two weeks and in the future, same sort of thing. Until the next test, you'll be able to do it, All right? So it's a brand new idea. I know it might not perfectly work out, so I'll definitely listen to your feedback on how it goes. But a lot of people really want to commit to learning from their mistakes. So this is um, a way that I'm gonna have you do that, okay? All right, so you can get started with this. I'll open up the laptop box if you wanna borrow a laptop, um, and I'll be around to answer any questions you might have. Okay. 